गुड मॉर्निंग ऑल मैम ऑडिबल Good morning. We are starting our reading club with the prayer. Seeking blessings from our Guru, Dr. Prabhu Vijayakar Sir, we have made this divine science very easy, like mathematics. Jai Nirmal, Jai Hindu, Kachi, Om Vijayakaray. Friends, we are in the journey of reading Organ of Medicines by Dr. Samuel Hanuman. He said it along with we are reading the book Theory of Acute. By Dr. Prabhu Vijay Kalsar. So we will continue our journey of uh, reading of organon. In organon, up till now we have learned about the theoretical part up to one one to seventy aphorism. Followed by we have learned about the understanding of the disease part and the myasm part and the case taking part. Now we are dealing with the understanding of the medicinal part. So in aphorism number one twenty. Therefore, medicine on which depends man's life and death, disease and health, must be thoroughly and most carefully distinguished from one another, and for this purpose, tested by careful, pure experiment on the healthy body, for the purpose of ascertaining their power and real effect, 
in order to obtain an accurate knowledge of them and to enable us to avoid any mistake in their employment in the group. For it is only by correct selection of them that the greatest of all earthly basins, the health of the body and of the mind, can be rapidly and permanently restored. So what Master is telling about that if we understand the pure power of that medicine, then and then we can understand that we can apply that medicine to the particular persons or a disease, and that is what the earthly blessings. So in proving medicine to ascertain their effect on the healthy body, it must be born in the mind of such a strong heroic substance as they are termed are liable even the small doses to produce changes in the health even of the robust person. Those of the milder power must be given for these experiments in a more considerable quantity in order to observe the actions of very weakest. However, the subject of experiment should be persons free from disease and who are delicate, irritable, and sensitive. So here he has given the idea that the drug has to be proven, even the strong medicine has to be proven on the robust person. Again, the, he said that the weakest medicine is also to be proven on that person and the person should be free from the disease. That means he is a healthy person, is delicate, person is irritable and sensitive. That means he must have that sensitivity so that we can get the symptoms of the proven. <laughs> In this experiment on which depend the exactitude of the whole medical art and the will of all future generations of mankind, no other medicine should be employed except such as are perfectly well known and of whose purity, genuineness and energy we are thoroughly assured. So this is very important understanding that even in our clinical practice also that we must have to know the proving of each and every remedy so that we can apply and employ that medicine for the applications. So if you don't know the exact proving of that medicine and if you know the genuineness and purity of that proving, then do not use that medicine. So what Master Hanuman is telling about that because this is for the future generations and we need to understand the exactitude of that medical art. So this is the few idea about the medicine, understanding the medicine part or a remedial part in our homeopathic field. So we are continuing the Reading of the book theory of acute by Dr. Kofil Vijayakar. So up till now we have understood in this book that the old concept and the new concept of the acute and new concept is nothing but it is something that the inclusions of the cardinal principles, whereas in the older concept the particular has to be taken into consideration and there is no cardinal principle has to be included. So this is what the difference little bit and in yesterday's sessions we have learned about some of the golden principles to be applied in our practice so that we can treat acutes very easily. Few advice to the patient and a few advice to the doctors when you are dealing with the acute. So we are continuing with this with the scientific explanations of this uh, uh, golden rules. So as we have learned that the golden rules of the minimum prescriber, that be a minimum prescriber. So the scientific explanations of these golden rules, he who prescribes the least is the best homeopath is the golden rules. So in most of time in acute conditions, if if and if it is necessity, then and then you need to prescribe the Remedy. This is the golden rule. One who wants to be successful only the practitioner or physician has to be wary of prescribing unnecessarily. We should in the first place be aware of when to prescribe and when not to. This is very important understanding in our clinical practice. So that if we know when not to prescribe, then and then we can understand that if we interfere unnecessarily that the health of the individual can be destroyed also with the small doses. So this is what we have to understand and when to prescribe and when not to prescribe. 
There are thousands of books on the Materia Medica as well as Organos and the philosophy which gives you the indications of prescribing remedies. But none of these tells you when not to. So this is very important. It is the wiseness of yourself to understand that when not to prescribe. But in such clinical practice of 25 years that have given such credit that two predictive credit is non-prescribing or a minimum prescribing both in acute as well as in the chronic. Paradoxical as it may sound, this golden rules of non-prescribing has a scientific base. So, the sir has given a little case and that is what the thing is. So, the case, a patient having an acute infective diarrhea came to sir complaining doctor. Today is the third day of severe watery diarrhea. I have been suffering two days. I have passed more than 25 to 30 stools, all liquid, almost transparent and sometimes yellowish. As soon as I would eat, I had to intend urge to run to the toilet. If there was a fraction of the second delay, I was unable to control my stool. When asked, why didn't you come to me yesterday or two days back? Patient is prompt, came, prompt came the reply that I had no strength to move about, nor did I have any control over my stool to wait in your clinic for the two hours. Then how did you came today? was my next question. So this is the first question. Was the next question. And he said, I just could not eat the drink since I had no desire to. Hence I felt weak and drowsy since two days. Since yesterday the number of two have gone down and I could get the desire to eat. And today since morning I have passed only three loose motion. I have the energy to walk up after a good night's sleep and so I came to you. So next question to the patient from me, do you really feel like eating today or you have forced yourself to eat? No, no, doctor, I had a real desire to take my breakfast today almost after three days. So this was the story of the patient. In the above case, the diarrhea which occurred has no doubt due to some of the infections or some toxins which were consumed with the food. So body or the system of the human being is so made up that... It tolerates no sense, no nonsense, and no toxins or nothing which can cause harm to the person. Hence, it has its own defense mechanisms which instantly start throwing out the toxins in the gut by producing hyperperistalsis, which appear to be us as a diarrhea. In fact, a diarrhea, at least in this case, was. In this case, was <coughs> defensive mechanism of the body to cure itself. The cure was already taking place, and after the evictions of the toxins from the system, and the patient was already feeling better. For example, less of the tiredness, less of the weakness, good sleep, and less cool, and he was gaining the strength, and his appetite was already back. So this is what in uh, yesterday's sessions of the Golden Prescriber, we have understood that the parameter, homeopathic parameter, so if we know that homeopathic parameter is in the right direction, then the golden rule is not to prescribe. So overall, the general parameters of the health in the human being, for example, desire to move, desire to work, the stamina to work, and desire to eat, not forcefully, and the sleep are more important than the loose motion. If these parameters are better, then it goes without saying that loose will have to stop. So stop is the wrong word used here. What should happen is stool have to become normal and this normalization should occur at the most in the next 24 hours. Thus, what the patient required was a placebo with a short, short prediction to go your stool will be normal by tomorrow morning. Such predictions are possible if you understand the physiology of man as well. So, internal, the internal physician residing inside the body, which we call as the immune system, has to be respected. And he is curing, that is the immunity is curing. So, homeopath or your friend has no right to interfere for he knows what is best for. So, that is what we have to take care So, such a type of the case is where that came across to you. In that case, you just have to prescribe the placebo and this is the rule for no 
prescription or non prescribing or when mm -hmm. not to prescribe another case what sir has said that the child coming to us for the treatment of the fever since the four days the child was dull drowsy talking badly at night with a thirst for a usual little quantity of oh, this child was uh, when treated with homeopathy or allopathy before coming to you has to be assessed not in terms of what medicine to prescribe but in terms of whether he require a remedy as on today first of all find out whether the range of the fever has come down last three days or not first find out whether the child is less cranky today find out whether the child has asked for something to eat today or not if yes, then the child is definitely on the improving path. If the child is fearful today, vis a vis yesterday, and asks for something to eat by itself, is the clear cut indication, even if the fever persists, that this child is curing itself. The allopathic physician may call it as a self limiting or a viral infection. It is not only the wrong to treat this child with indicated or non-indicated remedy, but grossly a seminal any prescription or a stimulation for the child's immunity is bound to bring about exacerbations or aggravation of the fever or diarrhea, and the child's recovery will be prolonged. So respect the internal curative immune mechanism of the man. So when not to prescribe and yet cure is hidden art of the homeopathic prescription. So this is the be a minimum prescriber. B. Hello. Everything is great. Sound is clear. Yes. Yeah. Okay, fine. Be a single remedy or a single dose prescriber. So if a homeopath wants to see a miracle happening, if he wants to see a typhoid fever vanish in just 24 hours, or if he wants to see a pneumonia clear up radiologically within 2 to 3 days or 48 to 72 hours, if he wants to see a 100 or 135 first cells in a urine disappear within 48 hours, or for that matter, wants to surprise his allopathic counterpart, it is only possible with the single dose of single and uh, similimum, and the similimum is always a single remedy. Uh, it was a fan on my head, and it was a hot day, so fan in Shalami. So that air sound has been coming. So I will make management of it. How about now everything is clear, no sound. Yeah, okay, fine. <coughs> So, doctor who prescribed the mixtures, patents, and the combination to say the Ferrum Fos 3x, Kalinur 3x, Natronur 3x for the fever, or Allo, Podophyllum, Proton 30 for combinations of this, Frigo, the diarrhea, etc., are entirely not at fault for abandoning the very principle of familiar similibus curanter or the seven cardinal principle of homeopathy. There has been up to date no real effort on the part of the homeopathic scientist to justify this principle scientifically. It means as much as as far as science has advanced. Secondly, the homeopath practicing rightly have never expressed their view on how to stick to the cardinal principle and yet get a result. Thirdly, the ego of other friendly neighbor homeopath is so big that he refuses to accept anything which another homeopath proposes and stick to his own guns. Fourthly, the knowledge of the right prescribing image or the duck picture not being available and failure abound. So these are the few points which is making us to understand these things. For example, a patient coming with a chill at 3 a.m., followed by fever at 4 a.m., the intense thirst for the ice-cold water during chill, headache after fever, and the chill has subsided. The patient lies dull, no sleep, though 
wants to wants pain despite chilliness, no bone pain or a body ache, does not complain much when the case is analyzed and repertorized. So this is what the symptoms which we think from this above case. One is the chill at 3 a.m. The symptoms, the rubrics which can be considered. The chill chapter, night, midnight, after three hours on waking. <coughs> the only remedy is fair. The another rubric we can think of chill, night, midnight, after. I mean, a general rubric we can take. So we have many remedies from this. And the another rubric we can think of chill time three hours at 3 a.m. Okay, or 3 p.m. 3 hours means 3 a.m. or 3 p.m. So this is there are another few remedies are there. And the same rubric, 3 chill 3 a.m. That is arsenic in complete repertory, 3 to 5 a.m. Kali Kaab in complete repertory. And in fever chapter, the succession of the stage chill followed by heat, it is a 98 drug. So such rubric when considered confuses the homeopath completely. Beside the question asked by the physician confuses and frustrates the patient. So this is what something that if you have idea that you can take this rubric as so you can you are confused. So that's why the sir has made the use of this chart. The smaller rubric of the chill followed by the perspiration with the thirst or without thirst and heat following chill and perspiration whether it, it, it is before the heat or after the heat or chill etc. are totally confusing with the different repertories giving different versions and indicating different remedies. Thus the homeopath is taken on a wild goose chase. He land up with two, three or at times six remedies being indicated commonly in chills. Heat first and administer the mixtures every two hourly or one hourly as the emergency demands. The fever come down gradually from 103 Fahrenheit to 102 to 100 on the third day and may disappear on the fourth day. The homeopath is pleased and happy that he has kept the patient away from anti typhoid drug or anti malaria drug or at least away from an allopath. He does not realize that the fever has subsided because it has to subside. The viral or the bacterial infection had to run its course and the immunity was geared up again to gain equilibrium. So I have in the beginning of my career practice what Sore is saying that in all this and other ways frantically trying to get result, I even admit of being so non-confident with the so many drugs and so many repetitions that many cases were referred to the allopathic physician saying that the serious disease have no treatment in homeopathy. This is something we all have experienced. So I also experienced the same. You take a course of antibiotic, control the acute infections, then I will strengthen your immunity. This is what a lame excuse is. These words are not just mine. I am sure most of us have who have an, a conscience will agree that they have done this innumerable times in their practice. But this is a real but when I started understanding the importance of treating man in disease and not the disease in man, the whole world changed. <coughs> To treat disease means the fever I had to give so many medicines repeatedly to, li uh, to literally hammer down the fever or the diarrhea etc. To treat the man I had to just stimulate the man with a single dose of medicines or similimum. I had to just be perk up the immunity to just encourage the man and come on fight the disease. So this is what the difference is there. So whenever we are thinking of dealing with the fever, we have a lot of medicines in our hand. But when we are thinking we are treating the man, so we must just need to prescribe a single dose. <coughs> so you will remember when we are seemingly doing this in a modern medicine. Yes, it is when we vaccinate. Vaccinations is the homeopathic in principle. We stimulate the immunity with an antigen, which is either the bacteria in a subclinical form or in an immunogen which stimulate the bacteria which is injected inside the body. This stimulus procure a reactions in the body which subsequently develop antibodies to the antigen or bacteria and thus defends our body. It cure and protects by a reaction, not by actions. Our homeopathic medicine also cure similarly by the reaction and not by 
actions. Now, a million dollar question is when the allopath can use homeopathic principles, similia, similia, the curanter, means the inject tubercular bacilli for the protections against tuberculosis and tetanus toxoid to cure the tetanus. And for all this require only one dose per month or then at the most three doses spread over a six month or a five years to make the person healthy. Why? Or why? Should a homeopath whose science is based on this principle require a repeated stimuli or a repeated dose? This was the question by the sir. Do the allopath require three or four types of the bacteria to be attenuated and injected together to give immunity to patients from the tuberculosis? No. Then why do homeopaths require two or three or more remedies to be administered to boost the, the patient's immune system? <clears throat> if allopathic vaccines can work selectively, though with a single dose and a single bacterial stimulus, the homeopath with his holistic approach has to cure following law of simplex and law of minimum. Thus, by this method of single dose, single drug practice, one managed to add to two of the most important cardinal principles of the homeopathy. By not using mother tincture and sticking to the dynamite single dose, the third law of drug dynamization is also added to. Coming back to case A, the importance should never be given to the chill, the time of the chill and the type of the chill, the succession stage, the headache, the time of perspirations. This chills and severing is the symptoms of the disease and rather the general mechanism of the heat productions. It is It has manifested itself only when the patient is diseased. So chill or a severing occur as a temperature increasing mechanism when the primary motor center for the severing situated in the dorsal medial portions of the posterior hypothalamus is excited by the cold signal from the skin and the spinal cord. This result from the feedback oscillations of the muscle spindle stretch reflex. The shivering causes body heat production to kill the bacteria or the virus or the parasite. This is the part of our immune or defensive mechanisms of the body and no doubt may be exhibited differently in different constitutions. But with the profuseness of the material available in the repertory, all of which may not be reliable, one is bound to be confused and above all, it is the disease symptom, a reaction to a disease. Then if we don't consider fever, chill, what should we consider for prescribing? So the question comes is, if we don't consider chill and everything, then what to consider? So we are interested in treating the man in disease. The man or the constitutions or the change image is what is required by us to understand and prescribe the simile <clears throat> No doubt, every symptoms, whether it is a pain or a chill or the type of the fever is going to be the representative of the ill person. But some are more representative of the persons than the other. This vital representative of the vital force are on the activity thermal thirst axis in acute illness to which we add other important symptoms to get the similar one. So, that's why the limitations of every symptoms make sure to make this process and to understand this thermal thirst activity chart and axis so that we can apply in our practice. <clears throat> so what we would like to know is has the constitutions been affected so drastically as to bring about the change in the activity other generals and the thermal thirst and the mentals. This means how has the constitutions reacted to the acute illness. So this is very important understanding that we have to take the reactions, how the person is reacting when the acute illness has started. <clears throat> if and only if the generals, the thermals and the thirst and the mentals have changed from the original, then and only then should the patient require something different from the original constitutional drugs. So this is again the law. So if generals is not changed, mental have not changed, the thermal and thirst has not changed and everything was the same constitution. So at that time in acute state also you require the same constitutional remedy dose and it will take care of. But if everything has been changed, at that time you require a acute remedy. This means that if there is a change in the activity of the person, the generals have changed, 
If there is a change in the tolerance of the heat and the cold, the thermals have changed. If there is a change in the water intake, the thirst is changed. If there is a change in the mental attitude, for example, the irritability, anxiety, etc., the so mentals have changed. Thus, the activity thermal thirst mental axis has changed. A new remedy which is similar to the new activity thermal thirst mental axis is required to bring about the cure on the basis of our cardinal principle of similia. So this is very important to understand. So if activity has not changed, then you have to think about the what the constitutional remedy you have prescribed. So you have to take care of everything. Generals, the activity, why activity is important in assessing the change constitutions is already explained in the previous chapter of activity. Now we have to assess the activity. So how this chart is uh, applied beautifully. So already I have shared this chart in the group. So you all have that chart. So when you look at the chart, you can think of that first and foremost thing you have to categorize the activity of the person. So whenever the person comes to you, you can sense the energy of the person also by looking the patient. So, so many a time in acute conditions, most of the patient comes to you with the decreased activity or sometimes the activity has no change or sometimes you find that the activity has been increased either at the physical level, either at the mental level or either at the level of verbal. So you have to observe this and sense this with your sound senses. These changes should not be asked by direct questions, but has to be observed by the physicians except in case of the infants. So activity decrease. Normally, the active, uh, normally an active person, a talkative person, the fast moving person become dull, inactive, quiet and slow. He either just lie down, not doing anything. So this is what the person having this. Just lie down. I just need to take a rest. I'm so tired and I had a malaise and weakness and everything. So I need, need to keep. But I am not sleeping. I just need to lie down. And the another person who become whose activity has gone down. So he becomes so sleepy and sleeps continuously. So he requires more sleep to get the energy back so mother may point out that the child is sleeping today almost at 10 hours and did not wake up to eat or to drink or in a both cases <coughs> the patient was dull though not sleepy hence we choose the first option the dull and just lie down so decreased activity is due to the large amount of the energy atp from the mitochondria of the cell is being used up to combat the disease or invaders or a bacteria or a virus or to transfer the toxins from cell to cell by means of active transport. The activity increase, this increase in activity can take place in the physical sphere or a mental sphere. The mental activity can result in either a mental anxiety or the mental hyperactivity causing loquacity. Thus, the increased activity is further divided into three categories. That is the physical restlessness without mental anxiety mental restlessness with anxiety, verbal activity, a loquacity. So physical restlessness here, the patient just move or compelled, is compelled to move by inner urge, unknown urge. The patient just does not sit in one place, move constantly, knows not for what. He either paces the floor or goes out of the walk just to keep moving. So this is what you have to observe. Many a time in acute condition, the patient comes to you, their legs are always moving, restless leg. In many a time, the person's having a restless hands and pidgety hands. So this is what something you have to keep in the mind and you have to observe that the physical restlessness has been there. <coughs> Mental activity here, the changes in the biochemistry of the patients make him ill at ease in the mind and the patient become more of the anxious more of the irritable, more of the cranky. So child keeps on crying or be, becoming snappies or just becoming ununderstandably obstinate and start kicking and striking and biting and etc. An adult cannot bear anybody disturbing him or asking him questions, all of which sends him in a fit of anger. In short, the mental tolerance of <coughs> all external stimuli is reduced causing the patient to go in the state of anxiety, a state of insecurity as to what will happen to me next. 
so this is what you have to observe so i will uh, will give you what are the question to be asked when you have to assess the dullness or when you have to assess something in the activity or when there is a no change so we have i have prepared that uh, the questions to be asked and the what to observe in the case during the acute state so we'll be we'll be reading in a later sessions so verbal activity in certain constitutions and acute illness can cause a confusion in the vernix area in the brain varying due to the unsynchronized impulses from the neighboring area the interpretations area of the vernix sends a chaotic message to the broca's area of the speech thus causing a loquacity and this is expressed in three forms either the person may sing either the person may mix verbs or sometimes the person so <clears throat> singing the, the patient is in a as the fever or toxicity rises become more accelerated and rhythmic he starts singing or talking in a rhyming language singing always does not mean the actual singing songs he start becoming rhyming starting substituting words from the famous song by his own words jack and jill went up the hill to patch up the pail of water nursery rhymes or a famous film song is repeated again and again so this is what the singing has been starting so this is something which we called as whenever the fever comes and it goes to the higher level of consciousness in this the delirious state the person cannot aware of during the fever he goes into singing he gets goes into makes verses or sometimes he is abusive so there are the rubrics which we have think of the delirium or which we think of a singing bit during or which we think of the abusive delirium abusive so these are the things you can think of so sir has made this in a very beautiful chart and the third category that we think we can see is a no change in the activity there is a certain condition which do not change under the ravage of the acute infections or the illness this means there is no change in the activity of the patient the patient has neither dull nor become hyperacting for all practical purpose the patient are the one who tolerate their illness without complaining so this is very important so if the person is so much so tolerating and not complaining so what are the reason behind that so reason behind that the why person is not complaining because of the person is very very contented so either he can be opium because the person is ever than to feel your sympathy from the others so he can be natural you or the person does not want other being troubled for him or not does he or she want to miss his duties work for the school so the work oriented duty oriented or anxiety conscience type of personality they do not complain so their remedy may be a silica <clears throat> so these are the few uh, practical hint by sir given to us now the first criteria we have understood that is the activity then the second point we have to understood about the thermal of the patient what comes next is the hot or chilly the thermal axis so here in thermal axis the hot or chilly this is a very controversial i have seen homeopath not believing in hot or chilly excuses being given for not believing are so there are few excuses that hot or chilly recording books are by western standard which may not be true by indian standard so uh, the person who residing in the switzerland in the cold area he is hot there and when he came to the india he become chilly so this is something the uh, controversial point they are giving excuses are giving if the mentals or the pqrs or other symptoms are coinciding with the particular remedy neglect the thermal these are the excuses hot or chilly are very difficult to derive hence neglected so this is something the homeopath has neglecting hot and chilly but what sir has answer to this is if hot or chilly has been recording in the western temperature even at 4 am aggravations or a midnight aggravation is also by the western standard should we then convert it to indian standard time and take a midnight aggravation as 7 pm or a 8 pm no we are taking as it is what it is there then arsenic will be given to the brain etc if the time is relative so also is the temperature so hot or chilly is to be taken according to the indian standard which also varies according to the altitude <clears throat> again 
how to assess this is very important so a chilly patient of the punjab may feel hot in mumbai or a chennai a hot patient of the mumbai may feel chilly in the delhi so hot patient does not mean repetitively the heated becoming aggravations or warm aggravations or the sun aggravation similarly chilly patients does not mean cold aggravations or colder aggravations or cold becoming aggravation as given in the remedy so hot and cold aggravation make it a particular we are connect concern with the generals now we have to consider or concern with the tolerance of that person to the heat or cold as compared to with the other around him in the same environment so this is very important you have to ask such a question that as compared to in your family members who is tolerating more cold and who is tolerating more Heat. So that is what considering that I must have the chilly patient, I must be a hot patient. So just asking this as, so you have to understand the decreased tolerance to heat as compared to other in the same climate can be safely taken as a hot. So sir, sub, sub logo ko fan chahiye, ASE chahiye, par inko to garmi mein bhi itna thandi lag raha hai na ki ye jacket fan ke sota hai aur chadar cover gar ke sota hai. So that means that person is chilly. So same way he cannot tolerate. So same way you can think of the decreased tolerance to the heat as compared to other in the same climate is safely taken as hot. The so decreased tolerance to the cold as compared to other in the same climate can safely taken as chill or increased tolerance to cold. इतना ठंडी लगता ही नहीं इतना भी कितना भी ठंडी हो मैं कभी स्वेटर नहीं पहनता हूँ मेरे घर में सब लोग पहनते पर मैं नहीं पहनता हूँ दैट इज वॉट इंक्रीज टॉलरेंस टू द कोल्ड सो ही कैन बी टेकन एज अ hot patients or increased tolerance to heat can be taken as chilly so this is what the things you can think in for example so here the example has been given by the sir people who sit in the places without ac or a fan even in the winter or a pleasant climate in which other are comfortable are distinctly hot people who need ac or a fan to be comfortable even in the pleasant climate are bound to be hot the people who rarely wear sweaters or are at last to wear a sweaters as compared to the friends or family member are apt to be a hot patient so people who require a double clothing or put on a sweater easily on the slightest drop of the mercury are mostly the chilly the people who can sit comfortably with a tie and close collar in the warm sultry room can be taken as chilly <coughs> most of time in acute conditions the people come with the coverings so those people who comes with the coverings that is something which is the, they are not tolerating the cold more and they are chilly a uh, many a times one find the patient mentioning that i feel heat as well as a cold very easily there are the patient who says i cannot bear the extreme of both heat and cold and these are called as the ambithermal so there are few remedy which are ambithermal they, they are the moxol antim crude natrum carb cinnabaris may be constantly sensitive to or intolerance to and aggravated by the both extreme heat and cold so mercury in acute disease like a cough cold coryza fever diarrhea etc is a sore condition represent itself as a hot or in a chronic condition like a hypertension due to atherosclerosis ulcerative colitis etc when the psychotic or syphilitic miasm prevails the mercury present itself as a chilly <clears throat> it is a sir's experience that's why sir has written this in demonstrating chilly constitutions please do not ask for the warm bathing or the cold bathing i have student being misled by the bathing water temperature bathing with the warm or cold water is not reliable because it is more of the habit in cities and advanced urban area where the electricity is easily available and heaters and geysers are easily available there is a tendency of bathing with the warm water which ultimately become a habit the more the sophistication the more the people tend to incorporate a geyser and a heater even in the warm climate as in the mumbai also So in a rural area or not so advanced area where the heating of the water daily is impractical, one shall find people bathing with the cold water even in the coldest of the winter. But it does not stem them as hot; it is more of a habit. 
Sitting and working daily in an air conditioner environment is also a habit for me. One find that the chilly person working constitutionally in the AC and that too chilled environment though the, uh, through the day but hates AC or even fan at night when he is going to bed. He has a constant tussle with his wife or a room partner who puts on a fan when he goes and switches it off again and again. So this is what the few examples given by the sir. Uh, talking of the beds, one find many patients saying that I have to have a thin or a thick covering on myself when I slept at night. Again, here it could be a habit. In such patients, one has to take the nature of the patients in consideration before stamping him as a hot or chilly. For example, a timid constitution like a calcarea who prefer to retire into a shell, find blankets and cover simulating a shell and hence wants them for the comfort irrespective of hot or chilly. So another point to note in this hot or chilly section is in the most of the neurotic or hysterical patient, one can safely neglect the importance of thermal. So this is what the exceptions in the most of the neurotic patients, you can neglect the thermal or hysterical patient because this sound antagonistic the reason here being that the hysterical patient as the word hysteria suggests have a tendency to react more than the normal to the natural stimuli say for instance an ordinary tussle for fan at night between husband and wife is going to be exacerbated by one of them to lead to a divorce to a suicide <clears throat> one of them is positively reacting hysterically when ordinarily contradictions by one sends the other into rage and the person is hysterical. So in short, when any reaction to the situation is out of proportion to the actions, the sensitivity of that person is simply bordering on hysteria. So hysteria is like this, the reaction which is out of proportion to the actions or the stimulus. Here in thermal 2, the same rule applies the heat and cold is a stimulus. If the patient is already hypersensitive to all the stimuli, he or she is bound to react more to the heat or cold as well. Hence, the hysterical drug cannot be confined to the mathematics of hot or chilly. They either react ex excessively to both or on the other hand, you find them changing from hot to chilly at a drop of the head with the swings of the mood. So we have a pulsatilla, a definitely a hot remedy in acute illness with the intolerance to heat and a closed room with desire for the cold open air it is known to be a chilly at times, albeit when the hysterical symptoms predominate. So changeability of pulsatilla can also make it swing from hot to chilly or thirsty to thirstless with its famous now well now ill constitution. So this is what you have to understand. थोड़ी देर अच्छा है थोड़ी देर बिगड़ गया कभी चिली है कभी हॉट हो गया कभी सस्ती है कभी सस्लेस हो गया दिस आर द चेंजेबिलिटी ऑफ पल्सिबिला सो अदर हिस्टोरिकल ड्रग्स लाइक अमोस्कस वेरेलियाना एसेफिड्रा एटसेट्रा शुड बी कंसीडर सिमिलरली नाउ द मिलियन डॉलर क्वेश्चन वेदर वन शुड कंसीडर द जेनेटिक कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल हॉट और चिली और द चेंज स्टेट ऑफ हॉट और चिली इन एक्यूट इलनेस सो this was the questions by the sirs that so change disposition anything which is change in that has to be taken into consider if it is not change you have to take the original one also along with the thermal along with the thirst along with the mental changes and then you have to apply the remedy now what is the importance of hot or chilly in order to understand the importance of the hot or chilly, it is important to study and understand the insulator system of the body. So here we are starting with this, that there are the two temperature of the body. One is the core temperature and one is the surface temperature. The temperature of the deep tissue of the body, which is called as the core, remain almost exactly constant within plus or minus one degree Fahrenheit, day in and day out, except when the person develops a febrile illness. The surface temperature in contrast to the core temperature rises and falls with the temperature of the surrounding and this is the temperature that is important when we refer to the ability of the skin to lose heat to the surroundings. The mechanism for the control of body temperature represents a beautifully designed control system which operates in health and in disease. So in health, the skin 
inhales the skin, the subcutaneous tissue, and the fat of the subcutaneous tissue as a heat insulator for the body. The fat is especially important because it conducts heat only one third as readily as other tissue because most body heat is produced in the deeper portion of the body. The insulation beneath the skin is an effective means for maintaining the normal internal core temperature. So heat is con continually being produced in the body by a byproduct of the metabolism differently in a different constitutions. So body heat is also continuously being lost to the surrounding. The various method by which the heat is lost from the body is called as radiation. The 60% heat is lost, evaporation 22% and by conduction the 18%. When the rate of heat production is exactly equal to the rate of loss of uh, heat loss, the person is said to be the heat balance. The factors that are important in determining the rate of heat production are the basal metabolic rate of the cells of the body, the increased rate of metabolism caused by the muscles activity, increased metabolism caused by the effect of the neurochemicals like the epinephrine, norepinephrine and sympathetic stimulations on the cells or increase in the metabolism caused by the increased temperature of the body cells and the effect of the thyroxines on the body cells so the metabolism has been increase. Hence, the heat productions in every individual depend upon the basal metabolic rate, muscles activity, the amount of the neurochemicals like the epinephrine, norepinephrine, thyroxines and the synthetic stimulant. All these are different in different individuals depending upon their genetic constitutions or code to maintain the heat balance in every individual, healthy individual and make all the system functions normally. The amount of the heat radiating has to be controlled. This means the people who have less heat generated through their metabolic or muscular activity have to conserve heat by accumulating more fat beneath the skin. Therefore, the chilly people who have excess fat. This proves by the fact that a three or a two marks drug listed in the repertory under the general rubric of the obesity in synthesis repertory mostly the chili drug. Out of 30 drugs mentioned, 24 drugs are outright chili. So that is what why the less heat production so it, uh, heat loss has to be maintained so that they are more chili and for that they have more coverings. So fat is there. So most of obese remedies like a calcarea, capsicum, ferrum, graphitis, FICO all are chili and the rest of two marks remedy all are chili. The hot remedy which is fatty so whenever you came across the obese people and the person is hot, you can think of this remedy as a handy tips. So apis, crocus, lyco, natrum, pulsatilla and sulfur, these are the hot and obese. So directly you can go into the handy tips of this understanding. So their excess fat is deposited to prevent the loss of internal heat to the environment by the radiation. Vice versa, the patient or the constitution which have excessive heat production within them have to release it out to the surrounding. Hence, the fat which is poor conductor of the heat as mentioned earlier is an obstacle and should be done away with so. So lean thin people like iodum, tuberculinum, sickle core, bryony, etc. Should be, should be what? So above idea is not the hard and fast rule, but just as an indication of how the constitutions of the person can have an effect on his build and how the thermal itself tolerance to heat or cold is a part and parcel of the constitutions prescribed for. So this is what you have to understand. In disease also, so for example, in acute cases means that during the fever or a loss of fluid from the diarrhea, maintaining the heat balance is slightly more intricate and different. It is a neuronal effect mechanism that decreases or increases the body temperature here when the hypothalamic thermostat detects the body temperature as either too hot or too cold, it institutes appropriate temperature decreasing or temperature increasing procedure. So what is the temperature decreasing procedure? So temperature decreasing mechanisms are the vasodilatations all over the body caused by the sympathetic centers in the posterior hypothalamus. The sweating too causes heat loss by the evaporations and decrease in heat production by inhibiting shivering and chemical thermogenesis. In order to achieve these changes which are brought about in the activity of the persons as a whole, 
the osmotic regulations increasing or decreasing the thirst and increasing or decreasing in the secretions of the epinephrine, norepinephrine and thyroxine, thereby giving rise to change in the behavior of the patient also. All this constitute an image as a drug picture which may or may not be the constitutional but definitely has to be in relation to the original constitutional similar. So this is what we call as a change dispositions. For example, if the constitutionally known sulfur patient has to suffer from the fever with the rigor, if he has changed thermal from hot originally to the chilly, if he would like being with the many friends suddenly start getting angry at the crowd, around him and gets irritated at the slightest noise or question or when disturbed and has tremendous increase in the thirst, then it is a Nux Vomica single dose which is indicated and not the sulfur because his activity thermal thirst mental axis has thus changed. For chili and hot remedy, the, we need to see the chart. So in the later part of this book, there is a chart is given. Again, the important scientific explanations of the remedy relationship, it has been observed that this world is mathematics, the human being and its beautifully well-balanced feedback system are all in the homeostasis because of mathematics. Even the intricate mechanism inside a cell or in a human is governed by the law and mathematical formula. So this was the formula given by the Nernest equations that govern the sodium potassium in all tissues and the cell state so permeability of the cell membrane to the various element is given by this formula. <clears throat> this and other mathematical formula abound in the physiology textbook. The, the definite value quotes uh, as normal for the hemoglobin, leukocyte, MCV, MCHC, blood sugar, fasting, post brandial cholesterol, triglyceride, protein, etc. are in itself ample proof of mathematicity of the body. So it will be only adamancy, if not foolishness, on the part of the physicians who does not agree that if the changes occur in the nature or the behavior or in the other words, in the secretions of the neurotransmitters, which result in anger and fear, like adrenaline or depressions and sadness due to serotonin or epinephrine, etc., are unrelated to the original nature of the persons. In short, if changes are temporarily seen in genetic constitutional similimum during acute phase, the new drug picture is almost certain to be in relation to the original drug picture that is sulfur might develop the area of Nux vomica or a pulsatilla or a allosophorina or arsenic at all, etc. So this is very important. If the, if the changes are temporarily seen in the genetic constitutional during the acute phase, the new drug picture is almost certain to be in relation to the original drug picture. This is very important. A calcarea carb constitutions in the fever shall develop a general, for example, thirst and thermals of the belladonna or a rustox or a nux vomica or a sepia or a silica or a graphitis or a natrum cup if chilliness in thermals is still maintained if the thermals has changed from chilly to hot during the fever then it may be mathematically manifest symptoms of the lipopodium or pulsatilla so it can be anything which is in relation to the prostitutional remedy so lyco constitutions if affected by the dynamic stronger influence may change to manifest the general symptoms of black acid sulfur pulsatilla Bryonia aridum, Kali iod, or Ignatia epica, Cilicia, Sapia, Nux vomica, or Phosphorus. Thus, it is of utmost importance to know the relationship of the remedy. This knowledge may accidentally help us or guide us to find the right genetic constitutional similarity. So, this is what in whenever a person comes to you in an acute stage, say for example, in an acute conditions, the person comes to you first time. And on the basis of this, you have prescribed certain remedy and the patient is better. And then finally, that person comes to you with the chronic complaint. Then you can understand also that the acute remedy is also in relation to the chronic one. So they are, you have to go to the remedy relationship of that remedy which you prescribe for the acute and you will find from the acute remedy. So in that relation also, you find the constitutional remedy. So this is what the vice versa help in our practice. 
So the case, a case of tuberculosis of the lung, which I have cured, amply demonstrate the upper the con con upper concept. The lady, aged 38 years, suffering from the pulmonary cox, came to me with the picture of rustox. Uh, she would be better and relapse again and again. The dose of Rustox every 15 days would relieve her, but the X-ray follow-up shows uh, after one month did not show any change in her activity. This led me to the interrogate her husband about her nature again. He insisted that she has not told me her real nature. He summed up her whole nature as unlivable, which she is so touchy. Anxious, irritable, and discontented that everybody in the house is afraid to talk to her. We keep distance from her because of her irritating nature. Then she nags and nags and complains that we don't care for her. She wants me to be with her everywhere she goes. She is so restless that she just cannot sit and do anything constantly. This is restlessness perhaps had misguided me to rest off. Here, after seeing Rustox act partially, I was sure the constitutional was not far off. I had only to open the relationship book to find out which drug had Rustox following well. Since Rust was acute constitutional drug, has to be have Rustox following well. So the remedy Sina showed Calcarea, China, Ignatia, Nux Omega, Platina, Pulsatilla, Rustox, Galicia, and Stanum following it well. With the picture now clearly showing the mentals and the generals of Sina, I did not hesitate to prescribe a single dose of Sina 200. Believe it or not, the cavity disappeared within three weeks, never to relapse again. So this is what very important understanding that from the acute also you can find a chronic remedy or from the chronic also you can find an acute remedy when you are using the importance of the remedy relationship thus knowing the relationship of remedy is must so those who do not feel the need to do so perhaps are not practicing holistically hence when i used to practice it that way haphazardly i never realized the importance of the remedy relationship so in acute chart sir has given everything at the end of that remedy that the remedy relation so this remedy in relation to this so that is very Important. So whenever you are using a theory, uh, Tau app, theory of acute app, which is in the Androids and the Apple. <clears throat> so whenever you open the remedy, at the end of that remedy, there was given a remedy relationship, the hot remedy in relation to above remedy is this, and the chili remedy in relation to above remedy is this. This was given in the applications also. So... We will continue our second part of Materia Medica. But before uh, starting with the second part of the Materia Medica, we will start with the third part, the hint of the acute. So uh, we will con complete first hint and then we continue with the Materia Medica part so that we can understand uh, Materia Medica in a better way. It was in the Play Store, doctor. You can download from the Play Store theory of acute. You write theory of acute, uh, you can get that app. So yesterday I, I told you that I will share one of the case with of uh, with you the case of the urinary tract infections and it yield to uh, homeopathy uh, beautifully within a short span of the time. So I will share that case with all all of you. We have a five minutes, so I will share within five minutes. Already I have uploaded this uh, to So this was the case of uh, acute cystitis. A 20 years old girl came with the complaint of uh, in the early morning came with the complaint of the burning urination. There is a red urine and pain at the end of the urination. This was the a few symptoms of the patients. Uh, she came to me in the morning uh, around 10 o'clock and she said that uh, I had a uh, red urine and uh, 
pain at the end of urination so this was the thing so on the basis of that it was a sudden and acute so i asked that uh, what is uh, what is happening so first and foremost thing we need to diagnose the case and if it is a red urine so the possibility of that red urine gives us that it is mostly the stone so i must advise her that go for the urine uh, blood urine and the usg so on the basis of blood urine and usg it is found that there is a cystitis with hematuria and the symptoms that she said that uh, in a gujarati that at the end of the urination there is a so much so pain at the meatus so that she cannot tolerate it that was the pain so the first report which is there it was on the 21st of august 2000 the cbc report shows that the hemoglobin was 11.7 total count was 13.13600 platelet uh, was normal 3.4 lakhs neutrophil 80 lymphocyte 15 eosinophil 3 monocyte 2 and malarial parasite not seen so again the neutrophil in this case represent that it is the acute inflammatory changes and it is a sora total count increase that that indicate that the bacterial infections are there by looking into reports the urine report suggestive of that on the same days the albumin is stress uh, occult blood is present the microscopically it is shown that the pus cell is plenty now when to consider the pus cell is high so when the pus cell is more than 300 the microbiologist write it is the plenty but nowadays the counter cell counter is there so they write the number of pus cell also in the report but in earlier days they just write that it is a plenty so more than 300 pus cells rbc 8200s and epithelial cell 1 to 2 so when i got this and the bacteria also present so this is what the bacterial infections in the urine but when i got to know that was uh, rbc so first question i asked that it is was a female of 20 years a menstruating female so first question i asked do you menstruate today she said no my menstrual time is little bit later so it is not the menstrual Things. many a time when you do uh, you are doing a report during the menstrual period so urine report shows that there is a blood in the urine so that is not actually the hematuria but it is because of the menstruation so many a time you have to be uh, very vigilant in a clinically and the usg of the same day suggestive that i must found that if she may have a renal stone but surprisingly there is no renal stone has been found the kidney both kidney are normal there is no stone in the everything is there but the things which i found that there is the thickened wall of the urinary bladder suggestive of the cystitis so i have only this data she had given me uh, the history in this way and it is in an acute phase condition so uh, 10 o'clock she came to me Uh, i advised the investigation uh, again she came to me after 12 o'clock uh, after two hours so after two hours she uh, i had only this much of history and this is uh, on the basis of this clinical re- reports and the history so i have to give a medicine to because in acute conditions you have to be very urgent to prescribe so what to prescribe to this case is there any idea from this so as a clinical many a time i used to say as a clinician whenever i see anything which is striking to me or a pqr as in the report also so i must take that I, and i prescribe on the basis of that so on the basis of the usg report i directly take the inflammation bladder because it is acute conditions on the basis of urine report i took a two rubric that is a urine purulent sediment that means the pus cell the plenty in there so it is a urine purulent and uh, there is a rbc it is a 80 or 100 so i took the urine bloody and the yes absolutely dr kusum the third rubric which i took that she had a pain at the end of urination so i took the urethra pain urination after aggravation so that was the things which i took pain on the end of urination that is the things absolutely so i took this and i repetrized the case uh, so on the basis of repetrization is an axvomica pulsidila sulfur sarsaparilla these are the remedy comes into uh, case 
so which remedy has to be prescribed so again uh, in acute conditions you have to go to the materia medica and search for the exactness of the symptoms what the patient is presenting to you so on the basis of that uh, yeah absolutely dr nisha on the basis of that uh, i go and search the boric materia medica and in the sarsa parilla it was written that the urine scanty slimy fecky sandy bloody gravel renal colic severe pain at the conclusion of urination so at the end of urination and bladder distended so on the basis of that i prescribe sarsa parilla uh, 200 and in this case it is a bloody so i prescribe a four doses for a two days so it is not a single dose prescription but it is a four dose i have prescribed in this case a, a, a bd dose for the two days and then i advise that follow up me within two days okay so sarsa parilla was given and the next day she reported me on the call that she is fine there is no bleeding so i advise go for the urine analysis only so on the 23rd so it was on the first 21st 200 potency is 200 sarsa parilla 200 four doses 24, 21st August, two dose, 22nd August, two dose, and on the 22nd August, she said that at the evening, she said that I had no uh, bloody urine, so I advised go for the urine report tomorrow morning. So on 23rd August, she came with the follow-up report, and uh, there is no pain, no red urine, and everything is fine. So I advised urine report, and urine report shows that first cell from plenty, to A to 10 and RBC is absent. So this is what the classical uh, reversal of a cystitis within 48 hours. Then uh, again, I prescribed three days SL and I advise to uh, continue that medicine and follow up me within three days. And then I advise another report that give me a CBC report also. So she came with uh, a CBC report on the 25th of August. And that CBC report shows that total count was 9,900. Absolutely normal. And uh, polymorph 60, lymphocyte 30. Again, it is in the normal range. And the urine report on the 25th, uh, the first L3 to 4, RBC absence and epithelial 2 to 3 bacteria and everything was absent. So absolutely normal. No antibiotic course will give you uh, this fastest result than this so homeopathy is rapid gentle permanent and super fast so this is what dr vijaykar sir has said that homeopathy work in acute as magic so that's why i am sharing with you that how we are beautifully uh, using this our medicines in this way so this is what and many a time you came across that the 20 percent cases you will get the remedy out of this chart so i am sh i have shared this two cases of this out of chart and i prescribe on the basis of clinical practice when there is a dynamization is there you can prescribe 200 and for more understanding on this uh, potency selections and repetitions you have to go to the question answer session one on youtube i have given a wonderful explanations on the posology and the repetition so you can understand in a better way. So thank you so much. Thank you for our learning sessions. Thank you all for being with us. Thank you all. We will continue our journey from today. So we, tomorrow we will uh, continue with the hints and the tips, the third chapter, last chapter of this book. And then we will start with the Materia Medica. Before going to Materia Medica, we will have uh, questions, how to ask the questions in acute, according to the activity, according to the uh, uh, thermals and that. So I will share with all of you and then you will have a vast experience. You will have a easy understanding and easy applicability of acute in your practice. So thank you so much. Thank you all. So we call the day off. Thank you.